You are tuned into the Dr. Tina Show with Dr. Tina Moore. For more, visit drtina.com. On this episode of the Dr. Tina Show, I'm going solo, and I'm bringing to you the information that I wish had been shared with me when I was in my early 20s and diagnosed with my first autoimmune condition. You see, when I was a kid growing up, I watched my grandfather die of multiple sclerosis. Quite literally, I watched his life go from functional to completely dysfunctional, and I watched him basically turn into a wheelchair-ridden shadow of a former war hero. It was devastating to see, and I thought that that was my fate. I thought that when you got diagnosed with a debilitating, chronic, degenerative autoimmune condition, that that was it. That was how life was going to go down and there was nothing that could be done about it. Looking back, knowing what I know now, thinking of the things he was eating, the way he was not moving around much, all the drugs that the VA put him on, all the surgeries, all of it. I think a lot of it was unnecessary. And then when I was in my early 20s, as mentioned, I was diagnosed with a blood disorder called ITP, idiothrombocytopenic purpura. It's a disorder where you build antibodies against your platelets. And when you get cut, you bleed profusely. I thought this was my fate. I was told there was nothing I could do about it. I was told that there was no solution. I was told that there was no way to reverse it. I was working for a pretty famous naturopathic doctor at the time, Dr. Rick Marinelli, who you've heard me talk about in the past. He was my mentor and my best friend. And he told me, contraire, there was a whole lot I could do about it. And the first thing that I needed to start doing at the time, per his advice, was to begin eating meat again. I was a vegetarian and had been for the past decade prior to that, and he told me to eat meat. Of course, I scoffed at him and laughed at him and said meat was murder and there was no way I was doing it. And soon enough, I realized he was correct. The first night that I had a steak, following his recommendation, took months, trust me, months and months and months for him to convince me. And this is back in the early 90s. First night I had a steak, I about crawled the walls with excitement and energy. I felt so good. I am a type O blood. According to blood type diets, I'm supposed to be eating predominantly meat. And here I was, a mac and cheese-itarian. I chain smoked. I drank way too much alcohol in my younger years, and I was sick as a dog for I cannot tell you how long. (laughs) This autoimmune disease was really the cherry on top of things. I was also suffering from chronic anxiety and depression. I was having sleep issues. I was having joint pain. And again, I was in my early 20s. My story is a much longer story than that, and it goes much deeper into the illnesses that I struggled with as a child. But I'll just say this. I was put on antibiotics from the time I was born through most of my life, and so I really don't have a spectacular microbiome. I think that the autoimmune presentation in my early 20s was the, you know, the universe trying to wake me up. I was here I was just a fledgling, you know, out of college undergrad with a biology degree, trying to walk into the next phase of my life. And I was struck down with an autoimmune condition. I did what any good American would do. I took my diagnoses on the chin and I decided that was my fate. I got a, I promptly after almost bleeding to death on the job, well, not really to death, but I was bartending and waiting tables and in San Diego, and I cut myself pretty badly cutting up the limes, and the bleeding wouldn't stop. And I can't tell you how anxiety-ridden, you know, driving it is when you can't stop bleeding. It's terrifying. And so my finger bled and bled and bled and bled and bled and bled, and this wasn't the first time something like that had happened. In fact, how I originally got diagnosed was I was getting a tattoo, the mermaid you see on my shoulder sometimes, and the red hair wouldn't stop bleeding. And my tattoo artist had tattooed me all over by that point, all over my body. And he was like, why won't this stop bleeding? Maybe you should go to the doctor. That's how it all started. So the universe was letting me know I was in trouble and that there was a situation at hand. And I didn't listen. I just kept living my life the way that I had been living it with severe lack of sleep, severe levels of stress, a lot of it self-induced, poor diet, no exercise, on and on it went. I found myself a few years later pregnant and in a very high-risk category. 
My pregnancy was no walk in the park either. In fact, I had to be monitored by a neonatal uh, hematologist the entire time because I was in a high-risk category because I could have bled out at any time whilst giving birth. When I did give birth, it was a completely traumatizing event, and I, I almost did bleed out. My daughter had to be rushed to the NICU, the Neo Native Intensive Care Unit, and she was completely transfused with a stranger's blood within hours of being born. I cannot even imagine what that did to her epigenetically and what the repercussions of that will be throughout her life. So that's how this all came to be. That's when you see me fighting relentlessly for you to take your power back and you want to jump to conclusions and say, oh, Tina, you're a terrible person. How dare you assume I can reverse my endometriosis? This is my curse. I say you're wrong. I say contraire. I say you have absolutely all the control. You just need to learn how to wield it. And that's where we are as a species, particularly in America. We have been getting brainwashed with pharmaceutical drug ads since the 80s. It really ramped up in the 90s and 2000s. You do realize that the U.S. and I believe it's New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that pharmaceutical drug ads are allowed on television. We have been so completely brainwashed into identifying our by our diagnoses, by our chronic disease patterns. Oh, it's in my family. Oh, my dad had this, so of course I will too. I'm here to tell you that Genetics may load the gun, but environmental and lifestyle pulls the trigger. You have the control over whether that trigger gets pulled. Now, if the trigger's been pulled, like in my case, I have a small collection of autoimmune conditions, if we want to label them individually. I just kept perpetuating the pattern. I gave myself these conditions. I want to repeat that. I gave myself these conditions. I walked my way right into them. Knowingly or not is not the point. The point is my chronically poor lifestyle decisions culminated, perpetuated, and compounded upon one another until finally I found myself in this pickle that I call the autoimmune rainbow. The autoimmune rainbow means once you're on it, you're on it. I think the simplest way to figure out if somebody's on the autoimmune rainbow and the cheapest way is to run thyroid antibodies. If those come up positive, welcome to the club. You're in the autoimmune club. This is a rainbow. At the end of that rainbow is cancer. This is a, this is a situation where your immune cells have decided to turn against self and start attacking self. Now, that can be driven by a myriad of things. You could have contracted a gastrointestinal parasite or gastrointestinal bacterium, some kind of infectious organism that you got on vacation at some point, and it started a leaky gut scenario, which eventually culminates into autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease really starts with leaky gut. If you're dealing with cardiovascular disease, you can bet your immune system's involved in a way that it's driving inflammation, right? So if inflammation is... If inflammation is at the root of all problems, I believe the root of inflammation is metabolic dysfunction, the root root, if we go back. This is why I just beat the drum on metabolic dysfunction to no end, because it is, in my opinion, the root cause of everything, leading to inflammation, that inflammation leading to dysfunction in other systems of the body. And you can bet if you've got inflammation in your vessels, in your cardiovascular system, you've got issues in your joints and your bones, you've got inflammation and issues in your brain, and so on and so forth. These are not isolated events. You don't take ibuprofen for your headache and it makes your headache go away and not impact the rest of your body. It's impacting every part of your body. So when you've got inflammation running rampant through your system, which most Americans do due to poor dietary and lifestyle choices, you can bet all systems are involved. Depression is a great example. I firmly believe that most cases of depression can be resolved significantly improved by really doubling down on good nutritional status, exercise, movement, mindfulness. I know it's a lot easier said than done, especially when you're in a chronically depressed state. But as somebody who lived in a chronically depressed state for the bulk of her life, I understand. That's what I want to get through here. I understand. I live it. I live it every day. I deal with chronic pain every single day of my life. And I overcome it every single day through movement, through the choices I make, 
of what I'm going to put into my mouth, to the choices I make of when I'm going to go to bed, to the choices I make of how I'm going to deal with the stress of whatever's coming at me via, you know, be it social media or my business or my family. Those are my choices to make. I have the onus of control. Now, I'll say this. I got myself here. This is my lived experience. So people can get mad at me and that's fine. I'm talking about my lived experience. I also happen to have treated thousands of patients over the years and I can speak from a clinical standpoint as well. No, it's not somebody's fault that they got in a car accident. It certainly was not my fault that I was in a car accident and I was hit and I was thrown into chronic pain. But it was my fault that I was eating like complete a completely piss poor nutritionally devoid diet, chain smoking, stressed out of my mind and not sleeping much when I did get hit. So you see here, we have a triangle and this is how I would explain it to patients. On one side of this triangle is your genetics. One side of the triangle is your environment, your your current and past lived experiences. It's everything. It's what I just described. I was chain smoking. I wasn't eating well. I wasn't sleeping well. I wasn't honoring anything about health. I wasn't exercising. I was stressed out of my mind. And the bottom portion of that is the trigger. The third you know, leg of this stool or arm of this triangle is the trigger. And that trigger can be a car accident. It can be a divorce. It can be something really, really stressful that happens. It can be a physical trauma. It can be, you know, like I've never been the same since. It can be a viral infection, very common. I've never been the same since is what the patient will say. That's what I dig for in taking a patient history when I'm looking for the root cause. I'm looking for them to say the words, I've never been the same since. That was the trigger, but the other two arms of that triangle are equally as important, and we put ourselves in those situations. And so my daughter, for instance, I've recently been getting attacked by a horde of people from the chronic illness community, and what I said was, I believe that many or most chronic illnesses today and chronic pain situations are self-induced. And I stand by that. Again, my lived experience is what I'm speaking from and my clinical experience. I mean no harm to somebody. I know that we don't ask for things like autism or type 1 diabetes or any of the other lots in life that we get. But I use the words many or most. Many, many, I would say most people walking around in the United States and abroad who are living with chronic illness, it is lifestyle induced. It is coming down to the way that they live, the foods, really importantly, the foods they're choosing to put in their mouths, the way they're choosing to move or not move. I understand that we have racial disparities. We have economic disparities. I understand all of this. We still have choices and we still have the ability to do the best with what we have. And after running through the math, at least in the United States, the bulk of people living with chronic degenerative illnesses are actually, do actually have the means to do something about it. They do actually have the financial means to do something about it. They're just choosing not to. And it might be lack of education. It might be lack of resources. It might be lack of all kinds of things. But I think a lot of it comes down to people just choosing not to or being lazy or identifying through those diseases and wearing their diagnoses like a badge of honor. It's like a t-shirt. You know, they identify with it. Why would they do this, right? Why? I know because I did it. I did it for over, well over a decade, you guys. I have this condition, therefore I can't go do this. I put limitations on myself and I had an excuse to get out of everything because of my chronic autoimmune condition. It gave me the ability to say no to whatever I wanted to say no to. It gave me the uh, the excuse anytime something went wrong, oh, well, it's my autoimmune condition, And I've seen it. I cannot tell you how many times patients would come into my office and be like, well, I have Hashimoto's, therefore. And I'm like, welcome to the frickin' club, lady. (laughs) If you're a female over 40 and you have auto, and you have thyroid, you know, any kind of thyroid condition, you probably have an autoimmune thyroid condition per the data. So welcome to the club. Yes, autoimmune disease is far more prevalent than it used to be. We have toxic burdens. We have loads of toxins and loads of manufactured, highly processed foods. And I mean, we are swimming through the muck of the modern world, and it is definitely contributing. And we have vaccination campaigns, and we have all kinds of things contributing. 
we can still do the best we can do. So let me explain this the way that I identify with it myself. I have a variety of autoimmune conditions. If I want to put my finger on them and label myself with diagnoses, I choose not to do that. I'm Tina Moore. I have a funny immune system. It's a little funny. It gets a little excitable sometimes. When I met my husband, I told him, I said, you know, he's like, well, you seem very durable to me. And I'm like, I am. I have a funny immune system. You will see it. And he has seen it. It behaves funnily. It doesn't always do what you would expect. That doesn't limit me. It used to. It used to really limit me. I used to live in fear all the time. And I used to live with that badge of autoimmune disease as my identity but I don't anymore. I just know that I have to navigate the world a little differently. I have to be careful in certain situations. I have to be really, really cognizant of what I choose to eat. So I have to have a lot of discipline about around what I put in my mouth. I have to have a lot of discipline around my sleep habits. I have to have a lot of discipline around my exercise habits. If I stray, I don't get the rubber bands that most people get, meaning I don't get as much leeway as he does. He gets to really mess around with those things and have very little repercussions. I I don't get that. I have very short tolerance bands. My immune system says, hearty fuck you when I push things even a little bit too far. So that is okay with me. I have come to a place where I don't have grief over not being able to eat gluten. I don't have grief over any of these things. This is just who I am. And how I navigate the world is from a place of empowerment. Now, I get off an airplane after, you know, eight hours of flying and I have had a little too much salt and maybe a little bit of sugar combo just right and I'm swollen, right? I'm much more swollen than the average person. As I age, as I move more into middle age, as I near 50 years old and get closer to it, I swell up a little bit more. I understand the mechanism of that and I know that I have some control over that. I also realize I don't have total control over everything, So I live as best I can. Am I 100% the best version that could have possibly happened for Tina Moore? No, I'm not because there was some damage done along the way. There was a lot of self-induced damage, a lot of self-induced damage. And there was, you know, just because people say, oh, I've, you know, I've done everything right. I'm like, honey, if you've been sucking on Diet Coke your whole life or for the past decade, you've done some damage. We've all done some damage to ourselves, right? So let's put on our big girl pants, forgive ourselves and move forward. I am living 100% or more of what Tina Moore currently can live. I don't grieve over the what could have been and the damage that's been done. It happened. I didn't have control over them pumping me full of antibiotics as a kid. I didn't have control over all the the abuse, the physical abuse that I endured from a family member when I was a kid. I don't have any control over that. I'm not blaming anybody when I say that many or most, you know, chronic conditions are lifestyle induced because we continue to do it. I see it all the time. I watched a classmate of mine die slowly via Facebook from ALS and They were doing everything they knew to do. Ironically, every time I saw a picture of him, he had a can of Coke by him. And I remember seeing similar things with my grandfather, to be honest with you. I remember seeing the way that my grandma fed him. And I didn't know any better. She didn't know any better. Oftentimes people don't know any better. But I think at this point in time, with the way that the world is, the onus of responsibility to know better has got to be put on the individual because the doctors are not going to save you. Most doctors don't know what to do with this kind of stuff. They know what to do if you're dying in the hospital or they know how to medicate your symptomology, but they do not know how to treat the underlying root cause. Many naturopathic doctors and functional medicine doctors don't seem to either. They want to hand you hordes of pills. They're just supplements instead of pharmaceuticals. And they tell you to go on your merry way. And they themselves are not walking the talk. They themselves have metabolic dysfunction and fatty liver. You can see it by looking at them. So that's where where we are. And when I say these bold statements that I know infuriate a lot of people, I say them truly with love because I live it and I have been here. The only way through this, or the only way out, I should say, is through. You have to go through the jungle to get out to see the beach, right? Like that is the world we're living in. I didn't make up the rules 
I didn't pollute the planet. I didn't invent all the pharmaceuticals. I'm simply here as a messenger to give you the information that you need to empower yourself, to take your power back. The minute you decide, I am not, you know, Stephanie, the Hashimoto's warrior, and that's how you define yourself. When you finally say, I'm Stephanie, I happen to have a funny immune system that likes to attack my thyroid and potentially my other tissues, probably. I'm going to choose every single aspect that I have control over because I can't control the things I don't have control over. I'm going to choose to do the best I can with the information I have. And when I don't have enough information, I'm going to gather more information. I'm going to take it upon myself to learn more. I'm going to take it upon myself to have more ownership over education and information that will help me and my family and the people around me. If your family and friends are not on board, which often they are not, they'll want to fuck with you. It's weird. It's a weird phenomenon, but you are in the role in your family that has been put upon you and that you have allowed yourself to be defined by. I was that person. I was Tina, the chronically sick one. My whole life, you guys, I was chronically sick Tina. It took a lot for me to overcome that definition of myself, and it took a lot for my family to finally embrace it. And they have. They really have. Now I'm Tina the warrior. I'm the wellness warrior, right? I'm out there holding the line. But it takes its toll. And I sometimes have setbacks. And I sometimes am down for a few days with tremendous gastrointestinal symptoms or debilitating pain or whatever it may be. I call them my flares. I have a flare, but I know how to get out of the flare because I've educated myself. And to have the tools available in your toolkit to know that you can walk yourself out of this, you can back up, you can reduce the flare. That's so empowering versus, and I know this well, the feeling of living in fear because you're like, oh my God, I am knee deep in a flare and I don't know what to do. And I'm terrified. And I am so terrified that I'm paralyzed. I've been there, you guys. I've been there not so long ago. I had a tremendous flare of back pain seemingly out of nowhere last year during all of this nonsense with the pandemic and like being constantly attacked on Instagram and social media and by my profession. And I mean, it was enormous. I don't think most humans would have survived it. And I went into a horrific flare for months. And what did I do? I self-medicated. I had not much. I had a little bit of alcohol every day and the consistent drip of alcohol as a poison was really contributing to the whole mess itself, right? And contributing to that leaky gut and contributing to all the things. I had to back myself out. I had to get really strict with my diet. My ideal diet for me is really, and I've been doing this for a long, long time, not just since the term carnivore came out. I mean, my way to back out of any flare has always just been focus on beef and fat. Get the vegetables out, eat the uh, berries and the stone fruits. That's my jam. Blueberries, stone fruits, like apricots, peaches, plums, beef and fat, pre predominantly animal fat. That gets me out of a flare. I've got to really double down on my sleep. I've got to definitely cut all alcohol out because alcohol is handled in the body like a poison and it's quite inflammatory to the gut. And when the gut's inflamed, everything is a hot mess. As, as I said earlier, that's really the beginning of autoimmune disease for many people. So these things don't just show up out of nowhere. <laughs> we bring ourselves to them. My stress was completely out of control a year and a half ago. I was letting the weight of the world get to me. I had to level up. I had to practice more mindfulness. I had to step away from things. I had to say no to things. I had to shut some things down, much to the dismay of many people. I shut down a Telegram channel with 28,000 people on it, and people lost their minds. It was insane how people behave. It's still, every day on Instagram, I am shocked at how people are behaving. The mental health of this world is severely crumbling. And I've watched it happen over the past few years on social media. It is, if you talk to any of my friends who have big followings, they'll tell you the same. We don't like it anymore. It's not fun. It's really difficult to post anything because the hordes just come at you of mentally unstable people. People are struggling and suffering. I have empathy for them, but I don't have a lot of empathy anymore for people who will not take the reins and decide to level up. If they're not going to take control and responsibility for their own health, then why would I even bother helping them? That is not my job. I don't care that much. 
The people I care about when I truly say care are my family. That's all I, the only people that I owe anything to is my family and some of my closest friends even. But other than that, I don't owe anybody anything. I show up because I am trying to be of service because I feel like that is truly my calling in life. I'm trying to help people survive this nonsense and to make themselves the more the most resilient humans they can so that whether it be monkey pox, we can walk into it with some assuredness that we've done everything we can to fortify our defenses, right? To stabilize our immune system. Because really all an autoimmune condition is or chronic illness is, is homeostasis is out of whack, right? Your body is trying, diabetes is your body trying to compensate for the amount of shit you're putting in your mouth. It's trying desperately to bring you back to a place of homeostasis. And the disease process itself is actually the body trying to move towards homeostasis. It's not that you're programmed for disease. You're programmed for homeostasis. Your body's trying to balance itself out and it's pumping insulin in an attempt to deal with all this shitty glucose you're putting in your mouth. That's on you. That's why I say that. In most cases, chronic debilitating illness is on the person. No, I didn't ask for the set of genes that made me, that programmed me towards autoimmune conditions. I didn't ask for that. But I'm not going to sit here and play victim and say, oh, poor me. What am I going to do? I guess I just have to live with it. I used to wear a bracelet around that was like a first aid bracelet in case I was ever in an accident that explained my blood disorder, my clotting disorder or lack of. And one day I looked at it and I was like, fuck this. And I took it off and threw it out the window. I remember it clearly. I was driving down the road in San Diego and I chucked it out the window. I was like, I do not identify by this anymore. Guess what? I don't have those antibodies present in my blood anymore. I'm not saying I cured it. You don't 100% cure an autoimmune condition. Once that gene is flipped on, it's on. But I mitigate it. So now, I, you know, for the past 10 years, whenever I've had my blood ran, my platelets are perfectly normal. When I get a cut, I clot beautifully well. Everything's fine. Did I reverse it? I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. Did I put it in remission? I think that's what it is. I think I put it in remission. But you know, it's sitting there waiting to rear its ugly head if I decide to go off target too far. If I start pounding sugar and eating gluten and not exercising and not sleeping and doing all the things wrong again, you bet it'll pop up. It'll rear its ugly head. And that is the messaging I'm trying to share with the world when I say that we have more control over our chronic debilitating issues than we give ourselves credit for. People don't want to admit that they had something to do with their own misery and that it's self-imposed. People don't want to admit that. And the first stage of grief is anger. So when I point it out and I hold a mirror up, people freak out and yell at me. I get it. But at the end of the day, your health is your responsibility. Again, I get it. I live it. I could write the chronicles of chronic illness and pain. I have lived it. I have watched my family members live with it. I've watched people I love live with it. And more importantly, I have helped thousands of patients overcome it. Because the minute you put the power back in their hands, it's up to them to make the choice to take the reins. And if you choose, if I put this challenge in front of you and you choose to take the reins, you take all your power back and you start building day by day. And my advice always, and the same advice I hold for myself, is 1% better every day. If I can just help maintain, and sometimes I backslide, like I said, and I got to just get back up to baseline. And sometimes that can take days or weeks or months. But I give myself the grace to know that I have the tools to get back there. And those tools come through my nutritional choices, through my exercise. Now, if I go over-exercising, if I go type A like I am and I overtrain, you bet I throw myself into a tailspin. It's the downward spiral, right? But my diet is so simplified and so clean that I can look back on the past three days and be like, you know, I feel terrible today or my bowel movements are really off or I've got a lot of bloating or I've got a headache or whatever it may be. I can look back and say, you know what? I know what I ate for the past three days with some very decent clarity. And I can be like, eh, got to rein it in. Or I can tell you that I haven't been sleeping well. I haven't been going to bed at a decent time. I haven't been getting up at a, you know, chronologically something's off. I haven't been getting enough sunlight outside time. I haven't been getting enough movement. I have an aura ring. A lot of you asked me about it. I don't 
I wouldn't say that everyone should have one. It holds me accountable because my heart rate variability definitely responds to how much movement I get. If I overdo it, my aura ring tells me and my heart rate variability plummets. If I underdo it, my heart rate variability plummets. And so my aura ring kind of keeps me on target and I just use it for that. I use it to track that heart rate variability and to give myself the opportunity to hold myself accountable. I can look on the ring app. I can look on the app and it'll tell me I didn't go to bed on time or I woke up multiple times for whatever reason, right? And we have to give up this all or nothing attitude with health. I think this is really the crux of this is people say, oh, I have this condition and therefore that's it. That's my story. That's the end of the line. I just have to live with it because they, the other solution in their head for some odd reason is perfection is like the absence of that condition. But I'm here to tell you that you can live in the gray. And in fact, I hope you'll embrace that idea because when you allow yourself the grace to live in the gray, that gray zone, you can walk that line just as I've been describing for the past however many minutes. You can you can walk that line of like, okay, am I ever going to have 100% thyroid function? No. Am I going to take thyroid hormone for the rest of my life? Yes. Am I okay with that? I am. I personally am okay with that. I did a lot of damage to myself, which did a lot of damage to my thyroid. And I had a lot of trouble when I was going hyper and hypo and hyper and hypo as a young person. Do I have some neurologic inflammation, some neuroinflammation, brain on fire? Yes, absolutely I do. Did I get myself into that? Absolutely. And I remember the tremendous levels of stress I endured that to be honest, I kind of put upon myself, did I need to go to ND and chiropractic school at the same time? No. Did I need to stress myself out my whole life over grades? No. Did I need to take such a heavy science load in undergrad? No. I didn't need to do all those things. Did I need to stay up all night with my friends going to concerts? No. Did I choose all those foods I put in my mouth? Yes. So I could go on and on, but you get the gist of it. I have made some choices. I take responsibility for those choices. I do not guilt myself for them. I aim for 1% improvement every day. And if I backslide, I aim just to get back to baseline, and then I go back to 1% improvement every day. It is not all or nothing. We have to give up this all or nothing. We have to do the best we can with what we have. This is my particular set of genes. I also acknowledge that I have several gifts that others do not have or that they don't have an abundance of. I have a really good working brain. I can figure shit out in a tremendous way. I have a very interesting way of thinking about things, and I applaud myself for that. I have a naturally, I'm a a bit of a natural athlete. Am I a high-level athlete? No. Am I as much of a natural athlete as my husband? Absolutely not. But I like to ambulate. I like to climb things. I like to explore. uh, I'm naturally curious. I like to find answers to things. I like to seek out new adventures. And so I really give myself props for that. Does my gut hold me back? Do my physical limitations, because I actually have some orthopedic, you know, aches and pains now that I do believe are immune induced. They're very much immune induced. (laughs) And did I get myself there? Yeah, I probably shouldn't have been anorexic and bulimic for, you know, 15 years of my young life. I probably would have more cartilage, but I can't sit there and beat myself up because I am where I am. So I'm going to do the best I can with what I have now. So I train to the best of my ability. I was just talking to a colleague who was at a party with a um, paraplegic. And this woman was running races in her wheelchair and doing all kinds of adventurous things through the use of her upper body. And she wasn't, I mean, this woman was much older as well. And she was having adventures I couldn't even dream of. And it's just because she, it's mindset. She won't let it stop her. Does she not have use of her legs? Correct. She does not have use of her legs. Is she missing out on life? No way. She is not missing out on life. This is what I'm talking about. Do you identify with your chronic illness? Do you identify with your chronic pain? Is it your badge of honor? Is your diagnosis what you wear on your chest when you face the world and how you define yourself? Or do you choose to overcome and define yourself as who you are, who your spirit is? You are just a spirit walking around in a fleshy meat suit. Don't let the meat suit limit you and take really good care of it. It's your temple. And I think people that don't believe what I just said probably have a harder time with the message I'm bringing right now. 
But I firmly believe that this body was a gift from the universe or a gift from God, whatever you believe. I'm not super into organized religion. I definitely believe in God. I definitely believe in a higher source. And I definitely think that I was put here at this time on in this meat suit on this planet to bring the message that I'm bringing to you guys. I believe that firmly that this is my calling in life, that I am supposed to help all of you become, for those who want to hear the message, to become more resilient meat suits, if you will. And that frees your spirit up to do the things that spirit's supposed to do, right? We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to take care of each other. We're supposed to enlighten each other. We're supposed to bring energy to the world in a positive way. And we are in such dark times. And I don't think it's a fluke that we got here. You know, I've watched chronic debilitating illness take over the planet since I was a little kid. It didn't used to be commonplace at all. And now it's everywhere. Everywhere you go, people are severely overweight. They are crippled. They're walking around with their knees wrapped and their hips are wobbly and they're on canes. And I mean, people are just not ambulating. I'm in, you're probably hearing the birds in the background and maybe the ocean sound. I'm in Sayulita in Mexico right now, recording this on my phone and staring at the ocean as I talk to you. And this town is cobblestone roads and it's all hills. And I was telling my husband last night, like, if you cannot ambulate well, this is not a good place to come. And really everyone we're seeing here is, it's kind of a throwback to the 80s when everybody was really of a, a healthy BMI And I don't care who wants to argue with me from the health at every size community. There is literally no data showing that carrying excess adiposity is in any way, shape, or form good for you. But we have plenty of data to show the tremendous negative effects that carrying around extra adiposity, most notably just what happens to the joints. Sure, give me a beautiful 20-year-old woman who has excess weight on her, and I will tell you that woman is worthy And so is the 60-year-old woman. And so is the 80-year-old woman. They are all worthy of love and compassion. But I'll tell you that 80-year-old woman has some severe, crippling, debilitating joint pain. And it's because of the excess weight being packed around for all those decades. We don't want that, right? We want to be vital. We want to shine our light. We don't want to hide it. We want to be able to express it physically. I just had Sean Stevenson on my podcast, and you guys haven't heard it yet. It's not been released, but he said something so profound. He said that movement and exercise is the way that we synthesize the nutrients that we eat, the sun, all the things that we do, right? Like everybody focuses so hard on what they're putting in their mouth, which I absolutely think is important, not from an orthorexic standpoint, but from a point of like consciousness, just I consciously choose not to put poisonous sugar and shit in my mouth. That's fine by me. There's no reason to vilify that. And then movement is how we synthesize that. We get sunlight on our skin and then movement is how we synthesize it into our cells. And I think that was, it made me want to cry when I thought about it because being able to move is a gift. And as somebody who treated, I mean, that's what I did in practice for a decade plus, you guys, is I treated acute and chronic orthopedic pain and conditions, specifically joint conditions, osteoarthritis. And I'll tell you, and I've had, I've I've struggled myself with my hips and my back for so long. And when I can't move freely, it is so mentally devastating to me. So to have the ability to ambulate is such a tremendous gift that I implore you to do all the things that I'm mentioning here so that you can maintain that ability. And if you don't believe me, go back and listen to my episode with Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, where we talk about how metabolic disease is really the root cause of most orthopedic conditions. And if nothing else gets you to hear me, it's listen to your pain, right? The pain is the signal from the universe, whether it's emotional pain, physical pain, just kind of a, maybe it's not joint pain, maybe it's all over body pain from an autoimmune or chronic condition. That is the signal to move out of that space. Pain is the signal from the universe and your body that something is wrong. Move out of that space. And now some of us end up wired for pain. And I've talked about this on other podcasts. I have a whole episode on pain that you can go back and listen to. Some of us are hardwired for pain at this point. I know I am. And it's called central sensitization. And I go over it in detail in that podcast. But the bottom line is, is this is something, again, I accept. I accept that I walk around with a dull roar of pain that some people will never experience in their lives. And it bless them. I hope they never do because it really, I could look at it as a curse. But also, it's kind of my lightning rod. If I eat something off base or I do something off base, it tells me very quickly I did something. 
Some people don't get that privilege and then they walk headlong into diabetes and they don't even know that they have roaring high blood pressure or roaring diabetes until it's they're in it deep. I know my body's so sensitive to pain that my body's like, hey, something is wrong. <laughs> the signal is out. Something is wrong. Rain it back in, Tina. So I, it, to me, my, I have said this before and you may have heard me say it. My autoimmune disease is a blessing. These are blessings from the universe to keep me in alignment so that I can work on my higher purpose and I can connect with my higher self and my higher being and the higher being of the universe. And that's it. That's the message I have for you today. When you define yourself by your chronic illness, it also gives you excuses to say no to all kinds of wonderful opportunities that life holds for you. It becomes your badge of honor and it becomes your most debilitating label and you have the power to overcome it. If you want to know where to start, I have so many resources. This podcast has many episodes going over this. I have a free book for you sitting on my website if you go to drtina.com. I have a whole line of helpful supplements. I'm not trying to sell you guys pills. I'm just trying to get good quality ingredients into your hands if you need them because I do think supplements help me tremendously. My favorite is Relax Tonic. If anybody needs to know where to start, try some Relax Tonic. You can use the code DRTINA10 to get 10% off your first order and It's just a phenomenal place to start. Getting enough magnesium and some of these other nutrients that's in that blend into you will often get your head straight because here's the deal, you guys. When you start eating well, when you start moving well, and when you start sleeping well, your instincts will turn on. And when your instincts turn on, you win over your chronic illness. You as a mammal, a fancy mammal, we are just fancy mammals with opposable thumbs, you figure out how to move forward. If you want a deep dive, I have a private membership portal called Resiliency University. You can join at the at my website, drtina.com. I have courses on my website that are helpful, specifically one on pain, Foundations of Overcoming Pain Naturally. Brilliant, brilliant four-hour course there that will help you understand some of this stuff better. So I'll leave you with that. I send my love to each and every one of you. I love you for being here. I so appreciate you for being part of this community. I hope that this podcast has been helpful for you in general and particularly this episode. I implore you to step up and take your power back. Stop defining yourself by your diagnosis and define yourself by your first and last name and who you are and what your purpose was to be put on this planet and move from that space. Love you guys. Thanks for listening to the Dr. Tina Show. Please be sure to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Tina, that's D-R-T-Y-N-A and Dr. Tina 2.0, as well as visit my website at drtina.com. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and mixed by Chris McCone. The theme song is by John the Guilt. As always, you can email the show at podcast at drtina.com. And if you like this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. See you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practices of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is intended not to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.